wanted to say thank you to all of you. We had a wonderful fall retreat last weekend, and we had a few of them that just want to tell you what went on and, and um, all of that. Go Kevin! Go Kevin! I'm first. I got sick at fall retreat, but it was worth it. Um, favorite thing? Definitely the worship and the giant fireplace to keep us warm. It's awesome. And the food, of course. Second, um, this isn't even half of our group. We had a good amount of people show up, and I don't know, it was just really great um, to see every like, there's just something about a group of teens getting together and worshiping God that just is amazing. And I just wanted to thank everybody who um, brought food, who came to chaperone, who prayed for us, and I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart. That makes me number three. Um, so it was so fun. So, you know, Kara's my best friend, and we we're like, yes, a whole weekend together. And Amanda was like, psych. So she completely split us up over the whole weekend, and I'm so glad that she did. I love Kara to death. But like, there was so much fellowship like throughout the whole weekend with so many teens. Like, I just got to know like all of the people there, and I was so thankful. So thanks for splitting us up, because it was really cool. And thank all of you, like, so much, because it was a great weekend. Thanks for praying for us and being there for us. You guys are amazing.
13, one line says that I really like, um, our weapon is a melody, and we just want to praise him today.
time as we sing this last song. Trust and obey. It's very simple. Be happy in Jesus.
We're in the book of Luke this morning. We're in Luke chapter 15. If you stand with me, I'll read some verses. have a red letter Bible, you'll notice that uh, the majority of the book of Luke is in the uh, red letter, which the words of Jesus. Then all the tax collectors, in verse 1, and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, Now in doing this, Jesus is going to share with us what's on his mind and what his biggest concern, where his heart was at. He's trying to open eyes and in speaking to you this morning, even though most of us kind of know I think most of the time, most of us, including myself, can get so involved with life that sometimes we forget what the main thing is. But this is the main thing to Jesus. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner, who repents, you may be seated. <clears throat> Jesus came seeking to save the lost. Amen. I mean, that's the sum of it right there. The last Sunday before a, a seven week sabbatical, I spoke to you about this Samaritan woman. There at the well, Jesus offered this woman spiritual and eternal life. The disciples were off getting food. And uh, that's not a bad thing. But we must remember what Jesus had said, I must go to Samaria. Because he came to save, to seek and to save the lost. She had sown the seed of the gospel uh, on uh, being saved there at the well. And go, she goes into town and she's telling everybody what's happened to her. And uh, soon the disciples are reaping the fruit of the seed that this Samaritan woman had cast in, in her town. God uses our stories about Jesus. What's your story? God uses your story. When you tell your story, your Jesus story, He uses that. Our purpose as Christians is to seek as Jesus sought those who are lost. Yes, we praise Him and we get together and we worship Him, but He was all about the lost and for us, that's what he wants us to be all about is seeking to save the lost. 
In today's scripture, Jesus is again communicating as to what really matters to him. What really matters to him is you and I trying to do what we can do to help people who are lost to be saved. I ask you this morning, how many people does Jesus want to be eternally lost? None. We'll get back to the scripture passage in a moment. But because of this, if you will, a, a fire or a burden that God has put into me about the actions, about how we can be more successful or more fruitful in uh, seeing people come to Christ. I want to speak to that just for a moment and then we'll get back to our text. Yes, we're to share Jesus. That's what he's asked each of us to do in our own way. But don't let your mind tell you that the only way in sharing Jesus is to verbally uh, share Jesus. There are many ways to share Jesus that opens the door uh, for that conversation, if not by you, by another. Uh, his teachings are becoming less acceptable by non-believers. It's becoming a little more uh, fearful, a little more difficult to share verbally uh, Jesus with the world that doesn't know Jesus. Would you give me that this morning? Our best opportunity for sharing Jesus and his love for people is right here before us. But it's going to require some change. It's going to require some effort and some actions on our part. Let me paint a little bit of a picture. Someone who's been asked several times to come to church by a friend. And they've said several times, yes, uh, We'll come. We'll come. And, and, you know, people don't often come the first time they ask. But then there's that Sunday where this family decides this is the Sunday that we're going to come. And it's the wife who really wanted it to take place in the first place when the husband said, let's go today. But that wife, that particular day, she had some things that she really had planned. But... She says, okay, okay, we'll go today. We'll get, we'll get Jim off our back. <coughs> Who you've been talking to, Jim? We'll go today. We'll get Jim off our back. And so they began to get ready. Don't you know that anybody, including us, that's getting ready to go to church is going to experience some resistance? can't find maybe the dress you want to wear. And during the process, uh, one of the kids is crying. I don't want to get up. I don't want to go. And the dog, maybe the dog went out and brought something nasty into the house and you had to deal with that. But when people are coming here as guests, I guarantee you that our enemy has made it as difficult for them as he can for them to be here. He's reminded them of all kinds of things. Uh, you know, maybe the iron scorched a shirt. I don't know, but I know things happen. I know how many times I've been told as a pastor where we were coming, but we got into an argument in the car on the way to church and we turned around and went back home. For what people go through to get here, if we have seven minutes to influence them, and that's subconsciously, I never realized how much the subconscious mind had to do with our decisions. It needs to be a good experience for them. Uh, no anxiety. It needs to be an experience of people smiling and welcoming and uh, Hey, I'm Terry. What's your name? We're glad to have you. You'll notice in the vestibule we put up a couple coffee pumps back there. And uh, 
You know, I know we got the food and the sanctuary thing to deal with. I know all that. And I, I'm not I'm not here to talk about that. I, I well, I won't go there. I just know that people have to know they have to go home and say, man, that, those people, they really welcomed us. They really wanted us there. They really cared about us. Amen. And I wouldn't mind going back there. Uh, it's those kind of things that I want to teach. Through prayer and reading about the successful ministry of others, I'm convinced that sharing the love of Christ must start right here. Right here's where it can start. Little things that you do, whether you realize it or not, is the beginning stages of evangelism, is evangelism. Everyone who drives onto our parking lot and enters our facilities must experience the love of God. God help us. Sharing Christ by showing our love for Him by our actions toward everyone who enters our building is evangelism. Uh, it's important that we prepare, that we plan, that we know what we're going to do and how we're going to do it to help people feel loved and welcomed and, and wanted. Now back to the scripture passage for today. I'm not positive, but I believe that Jesus taught these three parables soon after the experience at the well. He's trying to communicate to the disciples what needs to be on their mind and, and what is really important to him, seeking to save the lost. They needed help as we need help, and, and that's me too. It's so easy for me on Sunday morning with the many things that's going on and the many things on my mind to walk in and out and in and out and maybe walk by somebody and, and uh, not say anything to them. Jesus understands something. Everybody that hasn't accepted the salvation that only he can offer really is lost. There really is a heaven to gain. You don't hear a lot about today, but there really is a hell to shun. And he doesn't want anyone to go there. Uh, and he understands that without him, without salvation, it's an eternal lostness. Do you believe that? Yes. I believe that. Jesus told of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and of a backslidden lost son. This morning we're going to deal with the, the sheep and the coin, but in the case of the first two, it's really not about uh, a lost sheep. It's really not about a lost coin. It's about people who were lost, and Jesus is trying to get them to understand that people without Jesus are lost. <coughs> Jesus was trying to open their eyes, and, and now our eyes, now me trying to open my own eyes and your eyes, to that reaching, seeking, praying, and loving uh, the lost is what it's all about. These three short stories are meant to clear our vision, and they're also meant to burden our hearts. We're gathering around Jesus, they were that day, to hear what he had to say, but the religious leaders and teachers of the day were, were, were muddy, muttering. Let me tell you, they were not concerned about people being lost. They were concerned that, that uh, these people weren't doing what they were doing and Worshiping the way they were. I don't know, but they were concerned about their lostness. We need to be reminded that Jesus was all about loving people. No matter who they were, because he was concerned about all people, uh, about them being saved. To Jesus, being clean meant nothing more than 
Washing and how you washed, that wasn't near as important as people's souls. He showed complete disregard for their sanctions against associating with certain classes of people. The religious people of that day, honestly, they didn't get it. And even though we do get it, at times we need to be reminded of, of people are really lost. And, you know, we're here a short time and eternity's for forever. Jesus came to provide salvation to sinners. And we're in a day when, when there's very few people considered to be sinners. And we all know that's not true for all of us came into this world as sinners. And without Christ, we're, we're lost. External holiness as a rule is not interested in the salvation of sinners. Though looked down upon by most, he continued to go to those who were in need and do what needed to be done regardless of what the religious people thought about them. God help us to follow his example. Amen. Jesus was literally willing to lose his reputation to win the lost. Parties in heaven are not known to be thrown when an animal or a coin is found. A party in heaven takes place when a lost soul comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Everybody in this sanctuary can take part of that and in a sense have a sense of belonging and have a sense of they're, they're doing something to help win the lost. And if we were to stop with the lost sheep being found, this story would not be complete. If we were to stop just with the fact that this woman found her coin and, and had a party because she found her coin, that's not really what this story is about. The first two are concerned with lost things. Uh, the first two parables. Uh, and they were found and, and restored. And, and, and what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to narrow it down to what's really important. Our friends that don't know Jesus. They're lost. And when people come to our building. We don't know where they stand uh, with the Lord, but we need to do everything we can do in showing them the love of Christ. Yeah. Jesus came, he lived and died for lost people, for one lost son, one lost child, for you and, and for me. I'm told that and I mentioned this last Sunday that subconsciously most people have made up their mind or not whether or not they will come back here within seven minutes after they pull onto our parking lot. Bob, that's before they've heard of him. Before they heard a message. Which common sense says if they're not coming here to hear the music, and they're not coming here to hear the message, then why are they coming? People need friends and relationships. And we have to offer them friendship and relationships because that's, that's why they initially come. And Marilyn, that's why you're out there in the corner this morning. Because we want people to come back and come back and come back until they, until they get it, until they understand the gospel and they understand their need for salvation. His preaching attracted the lowest classes of sinners and he spent time with them. He went out to eat with them to, to do them good. God seeks the lost. I just assumed as a child that everybody was experiencing what I was experiencing in, in junior high 
uh, the Holy Spirit was after me, I knew in junior high that God loved me and he wanted me to be a part of his family. And uh, he drew me to him. This is a story about Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. Jesus is the good, good shepherd who seeks the lost. People must first be sought before they seek. Long before I sought Jesus, he had been seeking me. And if you look back before you were saved, you were sought. He sought you. Jesus offered them grace before they followed him. Grace comes before faith, and faith comes before repentance. Jesus narrows it down to what is really important. One lost sheep is important to God. One lost sheep is sought by God. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep, and you lose one of them. The, the parable goes, this is the story of the shepherd. He's lost one sheep and he's suffering. He's bothered by that. He goes out and he goes out to find it. Why all the reading? Why all the studying and trying to figure out how to reach? Because people in praying and seeking to be who God would have me to be. Sometimes, Joe, if I feel like we're not doing what God would have us to do, it keeps me up at night. One, one person can keep me up at night. Uh, we're living in this day when there's such a vast difference between the young and the old. And uh, it's not just about the new guests. It's about all of us. It's about meeting needs. When, when, when I hear that someone is gone and going somewhere else, uh, I grieve. I hurt. God help us. But even those of us who are here, we need relationships. We need friendships. The other 99 are safe in the sheepfold and the shepherd goes out in the night to find that one lost sheep. Why didn't Jesus tell the story and, and use cows? Or why didn't he tell the story and use horses or goats? I'll tell you why. Because we're more like sheep than any other animal. We need a shepherd. The sheep goes out in the morning to consume with no thought of anything else. And they get further and further away from the barn and they're busy and they're consuming. And before you know it, darkness sets in and they have no idea where they're at or no idea where the barn is at. And now they're in trouble. They're in danger. Sheep without a shepherd are in danger. We are that sheep. That without a shepherd. We're in grave danger. Uh, we are born in the darkness. And so we, we need a shepherd from the very beginning. The good shepherd leaves the 99 and goes after the lost sheep until he finds it. He goes out into the night looking everywhere, searching for that one lost sheep. His clothes are torn from, from the thickets and his, the brush has uh, uh, cut his hands. And, and, but he keeps seeking until he finds it. You know, I've often asked these souls that are so important that Jesus once saved so much. And he left it up to us. Whenever you question God, you're wrong. But I'm like, Lord, why would you leave something so important to us? God, help us. 
Those in the sheepfold are saved, whereas the lost sheep are in danger. Each sheep is of high value to the shepherd. Every person in this world is of high value to the shepherd, to Jesus. God's love for each individual is so great that he seeks each one out and he rejoices over every single one that is saved. And, and some of you are, are where I'm at. There's some people that I just don't know how to reach them. I just don't know what to say, what to do. There's some people that have shut me out. This story told by Jesus is not about barnyard animals. It's about people. It's about souls. It's about trying to open the eyes of, of the followers of Jesus to the needs of people. And the greatest need they have is for salvation. Before you were a believer, it says God sought you. And he is still seeking those who are yet lost. Lost. He searches for sinners and then joyfully forgives them with an extraordinary love. There's no love like the love of God. This is the kind of extraordinary love that God has for you. And it's the kind of love that God help us to show it to. Uh, I think it should start here. And you know. Sometimes it's a little bit uncomfortable. But it's, it's so important. It's so important. Joy is the issue in all three cases. The sheep, the coin, and the lost son. And when the lost are found, there's joy. And there's celebration in heaven. Who is the shepherd? We all know. He's God's son. It is the work of the Son, the Good Shepherd, to search for the lost and seek them until they're found. Jesus took a journey from heaven to this dark world to find lost sheep and to save them from their sins. How does it end? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross and took on the shame, bearing on his shoulders that lost sheep. That was me. That was most of you. There is no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than up in heaven. The first story of lostness is, is about <coughs> suffering. Uh, Jesus really does love everybody. The shepherd is Jesus, the lost coin. Just suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. And, and why a woman? Because there's no love like, like a, a woman's love, a mother's love. Palestine women receive ten coins as a wedding gift. They often put them on a necklace and uh, wore them around their uh, neck. It's kind of like our wedding ring, what we give to our wives, that's men. And to lose that would be a terrible thing. And so she immediately uh, lit uh, the candles and got out the broom and began to search diligently until she found that one lost coin that was saved. And again, Jesus is trying to show us that uh, how important one one lost person is that we would diligently do whatever it is we have to do to seek and to see that one lost person come to Jesus. In the same way, in verse 10, Jesus says, There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Each individual person in this world is precious to God. He grieves over every lost individual in this world. He grieves over them. If each of God's children would share God's love and concern for the lost and dil diligently seek them, it's more than just 
talk. Actions speak louder than words. It's showing them by our actions that God loves them and we love them too. Uh, the woman is typical of the spirit operating through the church. It's more than just us, yes. But it's through us and the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus. And it's not about sheep. It's not about coins. It's about people. It's about people who, who need Jesus. A song stand. About 12% of people in America will be in church this morning. And they tell me within a few years in reading that it'll be down to 10% in just a few years. The harvest field is right. The harvest. Bob leads, please.
Oh Jesus, all of us here who know you, it's because you saw it us. I thank you for Dean Pierce and for pastors and youth leaders and friends, whoever it was you spoke through to draw us to you. Help us to, to let you work through us, to join with you in the great work you have of bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even when the path is deep and dark, you're with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You have prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with the oil of your spirit. Our cup of blessing overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Well with the Lord forever. Bless you, Lord. As we go from this hour of thought and prayer and worship into an hour of fellowship with food, help us to enjoy that thoroughly, to let your spirit work in and through us in this fellowship, in this community of believers. We pray in Jesus' name.